I would like also to thank you all for accepting our invitation and coming to our event. At the beginning of the press conference, uh, Dr. Rouhani will have his opening remarks, and after that, we will get your questions. No, let me, let me without further ado, uh, invite Dr. Rouhani to give the floor and begin his introductory remarks. His Excellency, floor, your, floor is yours. In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful, it is a pleasure to spend the last hours of my presence here in New York to have the opportunity here to meet with the dear members of uh, the well-known international press and to explain a bit about the program that we led in the past four days in my delegation here and also to provide an opportunity to respond to your questions. In the last four working days in New York, I found uh, an opportunity in three different stages to uh, explain the perspectives and views from Iran. First, on during my speech at the UN General Assembly on the first day of my visit here, working day, and then as the head of the non-aligned movement uh, on, the, on the disarmament conference, where I also gave a speech and Finally, today, at uh, the ministerial uh, meeting and summit of the non-aligned movement, in each of these three speeches, based on the subject, I had the opportunity to express some of the views of, of my country and my government. In addition to these speeches, which you uh, have also uh, seen, I had the opportunity to meet with a number of uh, leaders from various international organizations uh, on and at times during bilateral meetings, at times uh, we also had an opportunity to discuss both regional and international affairs. Among those, I can mention a meeting with the presidents of France, Austria, the prime minister of Pakistan, Tunisia, the president of Turkey, Lebanon, Sri Lanka, uh, the vice president President of Iraq, as well as the UN Secretary General and his deputies, and the Prime Ministers of Italy, Spain, the Foreign Minister of Germany, the head of the IMF, the President of the OIC, the Special Representative of the United Nations Secretary General on Syria, Special Envoy on Syria, as well as a number of other um, side meetings with countries who had sent representatives to the 68th General Assembly session this year in New York. In addition, last uh, back yesterday evening, I had the opportunity to meet with my fellow compatriots from uh, who reside here. It was a very warm meeting and gathering to, and an opportunity for me to meet with Iranians who are residents here in the United States of America. I hope that they all serve as our envoys of Iran, uh, the ambassadors of Iran here in the United States, and to also convey the views of Americans to us back home. In addition, we've had discussions in the past couple of days 
with the leaders of the Islamic organizations here in the United States, as well as with the senior members from the U.S. media and press. We've met and had breakfast, working breakfast sessions, etc. And that also created an opportunity to as well meet with um, think tanks and you know experts on foreign policy and on policy making here in the United States yesterday just yesterday we had a lovely event participated by members of the Asia Society and the Council on Foreign Relations where I uh, also uh, had a speech and an opportunity to answer questions. Although there were numerous requests for interviews by television networks or famous newspapers and magazines, because of my limited time, I was only able to give an interview to CNN and PBS and Washington Post, the Washington Post. During this uh, trip, our foreign minister, Dr. Javad Zarif, who also uh, has received the task from my government to, to lead on behalf of Iran, the P5 plus 1 talks led meetings with his counterparts in that group, uh, not only with other, he's met not only with other of his counterparts on the sidelines of the General Assembly, but in addition he met in the, with the P5 plus 1 yesterday with the foreign ministers of the, the, all the parties at the table, and he himself said that the meeting was uh, very positive and very hopeful, and we hope that these talks will yield in a short period of time tangible results. Other people follow, who came with me here, including the President of the Chamber of Commerce of Iran, who also is the Chief of Staff of the Presidential Office in Iran, and uh, uh, the Deputy President, who, the, the Vice President on Tourism, and uh, Iranian Heritage accompanied me on this trip. There were two members of the parliament who came on this trip, including a representative from, the, from Shiraz and uh, the representative from the parliament on behalf of the minority Jewish community of Iran. And they, too, held their own bilateral meetings as well as several larger meetings. I have to point out on behalf of all uh, the, uh, that we're grateful to all the members of the UN mission, he, Iranian mission to the United Nations here in New York, as well as the officials at the United Nations and anyone who's made efforts in order to assist our delegation during its stay here in New York. I must also uh, stress, I feel that I should stress that uh, it felt that the, in speaking with senior European officials and also hearing Mr. Obama, the President of the United States, it seemed that they sounded different compared to the past. And I view that as a positive step in the settlement of the differences between the Islamic Republic of Iran and the West. I believe that the media and the press plays an exceptional role, and therefore I expect from you to serve as messengers who, who convey the accurate message without any shortcomings or more or less on a ba very balanced manner to the world public opinion and to the authorities around the world. I thank you very much. Now we will take your questions. I would like to kindly 
ask you to raise only one short and clear question and identify your name and your affiliation before uh, asking your question. Let's start with Associated Press, Mrs. Lederer. Edis, go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, President Rouhani, and thank you uh, for doing this press conference. Um, you just mentioned that um, you saw the different tone of President Obama as a positive step. Um, Yet you didn't take the opportunity to meet him. I know you've said you thought that the arrangements uh, were going too fast and perhaps it wasn't yet the right time. What steps would need to be taken in order for you to actually sit down and meet President Obama and have a serious discussion about U.S.-Iranian relations? Thank you very much. As you pointed out, the in, uh, sort of early plan was made on a prep level to arrange for a meeting between uh, Mr. Obama and I. Uh, on the American side, they had expressed a desire to have a meeting, and in principle, we also did not see any problems with having a meeting as such. But in the planning phase, uh, in order to make this meeting come about and ensure that, it, uh, that its conclusions would be uh, solid, we felt that in fact both sides that there was not sufficient time and both sides were convinced as a result that the timetable that we had was too short in order to plan a meeting of two presidents perhaps. What matters to us is the result of such meetings. You are aware that after 35 years of uh, great tensions between Iran and the United States and the very numerous issues that persist in the relationship, a meeting of the presidents for the first time in this period will naturally come along with certain complications of its own. Now, the two sides wanted to have a completely successful and effective meeting. Uh, so I think that the environment that has been created as a result of this early discussion is quite different from the past. And having said that, those who have helped this environment come about are the people of Iran. And their voice during the elections on Hordat 24th or 14th, uh, 16th of June. And it led to a new environment, not only in Iran, but I would say, are you globally? In fact, in all our discussions with senior Western officials on this trip, it, all of them emphasized that the Iranian elections was a point of departure, a new juncture, so to say, that led to a new environment in order to pave the way for better relations. I think that the first step was taken on this very trip, and that step was the meeting of the P5 plus 1 at the level of ministers. and the U.S. Secretaries and Secretary of State. And therefore, you know, the planning for this had taken the past three or two weeks. And given that, I personally am satisfied with the result. So 
I believe from that experience that the steps must be taken in a very ca well thought out manner. They have to look at the results because our end goal is to ensure the interests of both sides, both nations, to um, in fact remove the problems on the way and step by step to build confidence between two nations and two governments. CBS News. Mr. President, uh, sir, you talk about this environment being quite different. Um, and I wonder, after yesterday's meeting, do you feel that European and U.S. officials are convinced that Iran is really ready to negotiate? And is Iran willing to immediately open up its facilities to answer their questions and to put to rest these concerns about Iran's nuclear program. The P5 plus one has been set up for, to serve this purpose. The P5 plus one covers issues on the nuclear uh, program and on how to ensure that the Iranian people can enjoy their rights in this field and at the same time to build confidence in the process. In my own negotiations with senior European officials, it uh, was clear that their view was that the environment that has been created as a result of Iran's elections in this new government is completely different from the past. The conditions are such that the path has been already facilitated or paved to a great extent in order to create the confidence required. And I am hopeful that under such um, circumstances, with sufficient will on both sides, and I assure you that on the Iranian side, this will is there uh, fully, 100 percent, that within a very short period of time, the, there will be a settlement on the nuclear file, uh, on the nuclear issue. I believe, personally, that in a not too distant uh, future, we'll be able to resolve and settle the nuclear issue uh, step by step and to pave the way for Iran's uh, better relations with the West, including the expansion of economic ties, the expansion of cultural ties, and specifically the expansion of such relations between the Western nations and Iran. Mrs. Marina Portnaya, Russia Today. Hello, Mr. President. Um, during your time here in New York, uh, you have made very positive statements and offered um, many new proposals to the international community, specifically to the U.S. Uh, and its allies. But do your words and actions enjoy the full support of all forces in Iran? How strong is the opposition domestically? in Iran to your new initiatives. من قبلا هم در یک مصاحبه ای اعلام کردم I had announced previously in an interview that my government has full and all required and necessary authorities uh, to hold talks with its foreign counterparts. Uh, when it comes to the nuclear negotiations, it has complete authority on that. And that when it comes to th these nuclear talks, I task my own foreign minister with the responsibility to lead them. I believe that whatever result we achieve through negotiations my government does will have the full backing of all the um, powers, meaning the three main branches of power in Iran as well as the support of the people of Iran. Um, 
such, uh, you know, faithful events such as this series of negotiations uh, cannot happen without f the full support inside Iran for it and a full consensus and internal consensus to lead them. Therefore, my government has all the required uh, prerogatives and authority in order to ensure that the res required results are yielded through negotiations on its part. Mr. Nizlar Abud Al Mayadi. Assalamu alaikum, Mr. President. Nizar Abud Al Mayadi in Beirut. My question is regarding your alliances in the region. Of course, you met Mr. Akhtar Brahimi and you discussed with him probably Geneva talks and the situation in Syria. Uh, did you really book your seat there in Geneva too, should that conference happen? Another thing, what's going to happen with regard to your long-standing uh, policy in supporting resistance in the region, Hamas, Hezbollah, and the rest, how will that affect your reconciliation with the Western uh, countries? Thank you. You know that the issues in our region are uh, very important specifically Syria. Syria is in a middle of a very dangerous internal uh, strife war. We believe that we must walk hand in hand in order to put an end to this war and to this conflict there and to actually create a setting where in the future the people of Syria would be able to decide about the fate of their country under safe and secure circumstances and to make the prerequisite decisions. Our relations with the countries in the region is not in conflict in any manner with our relations with, West, with the West because our foreign policy follows a series of fundamental principles shaped based on our national interests but not that alone as well as the national interests of our neighbors and regional countries and the mutual interests that Iran and other world players, including Western players, have in forwarding in international politics and relations. What is, matters is that we seek stability and peace and the eradication of fertile ground for war in the region and that we oppose foreign intervention in the region. We also are opposed to the presence of foreign forces in our region and we are convinced that the relations among the regional countries should be friendlier and closer on the question of Syria. We are talking with its neighbors, with Iraq, Lebanon, Turkey. We are constantly conversing and consulting each other. A Geneva tour or any other international gathering of sorts or activities, should Iran be participated, it will actively par uh, accept that invitation and participate for the sake of the Syrian people. We believe that the solution to the Syrian crisis is not a military one, but a political one. We also believe that countries that have shape uh, and the future of Syria should actually walk hand in hand in order to put an end to the suffering of the Syrian people. First and for foremost, we believe that the application of chemical weapons in the region is extremely dangerous. We s seriously condemn its use. And we are glad that the Syrian government has accepted to accede to the Convention on Chemical Weapons, CWC. And we hope that all the countries in the region will most certainly agree to join CWC, including a regime that has a very dangerous arsenal of 
weapons of mass destruction and to join not only the NPT but also all other rules, international agreements on non-proliferation and elimination of such weapons. Thank you. Next question, Francesco Semprini. Oh, hi, Francesco Semprini. La stampa. Thank you, Mr. President, first for this opportunity. Yesterday, Mr. President, you had a meeting with the Italian Prime Minister, uh, Enrico Letta. He said that it was a very interesting meeting, uh, but he also said that looking at the historical relation between the two countries, uh, it would be helpful if Italy would be more involved in the, in the uh, nuclear negotiation. So my question is, do you think that will be helpful for both the parties if Italy will the discussion between Iran and the five plus one group? Thank you. Uh, my meeting with the Prime Minister of Italy was a very useful um, meeting. Uh, we, as it gave us an opportunity to speak about uh, areas of mutual interest. Any country, every country that can help expedite the settlement of the nuclear file uh, will be welcomed in, uh, for their efforts in our midst. Even as, as Iran would welcome them. But the, the issue of discussion was not that it, you know Italy should be part of the P5 plus one. That's not what was discussed at all. And in fact, what was said was that Italy is a key country in the European Union and therefore should make every effort within the, the Union in order to help expedite the settlement of Iran's nuclear program. Um, after all, they themselves tell us that this is a gathering of a three plus three. They don't want to make it three plus four naturally. What really was discussed and mattered was that Italy should, as a key member of the European Union, make efforts to expedite this process. Mr. Akhavan, IRIB. Rahman Rahim. I, Dr. Rani Khassan, I wish to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you a Dr. Rahani, I think your few days of visit to New York City has been quite tiresome and very intense. My question is, it's been more than 15 months uh, that the Islamic Republic of Iran has been leading as the president of the non-aligned movement. And this morning you had a speech as the uh, leader of NAM through the Islamic Republic's presidency, and you announced to the member countries that your wish is for the, the proposal you set forth was for the area, the region, and the world at large, but specifically the Middle East, to be free of weapons of mass destruction. If you could please set forth an agenda for the near future vis-a-vis -vis the non-aligned movement. The Middle East is a very sensitive part of the world. And weapons of mass destruction is very dangerous for the region, at least in two phases. And now, according, based on some news, uh, at three levels and phases, in our region, uh, illegitimate weapons have been of mass destruction have been used. One is clear, the chemical weapons attack of Iraq against Iran. 
in the 1980s that led to many injured and many killed. Some of those injured are still suffering to this day. The other application of such weapons was in Syria, and there were cases of the use of legitimate weapons during the liberation of Kuwait, with which the news covered at the time. Anyhow, in our region, weapons of mass destruction have been used twice. Uh, as far as we're concerned, therefore, a competition, a race for the acquisition of weapons of mass destruction can be very hazardous for our region. We have for years made a proposal and pursued it actively we will, to have a Middle East free of weapon, nuclear weapons. We still are committed to making that happen and realize it. When we ha were in discussions with the EU Troika, uh, during, when I led them, uh, the neg nuclear negotiations, we had the discussions about the need to involve Europe and help us create a Middle East region free of W of nuclear weapons. Uh, and in the disarmament conference, we also emphasized on that the, we have a proposal to see a Middle East zone of free of weapon of nuclear weapons. Um, in our region, so far, there is one single regime that ha has nuclear weapons. Therefore, I think it's incumbent on all to m ensure that the entire region will be free of nuclear weapons in specific and any weapons of mass destruction in general, as it can be very dangerous for the stability of the region. Added to that is the fact that there are countries who have their military forces stationed in the region, and based on some intelligence sources, it is believed that they too have uh, and carry uh, weapons of mass destruction. So if a zone as such is created, it will bar the entry of, for example, carriers and ships that should have such weapons on them from entering the Middle East. And this is a proposal that we are committed to, since more specifically as the chairman of the non-aligned movement, as long as we hold it. Thank you. Next question, Mr. Nezu, NHK. Next, Mrs. Christian Salumi, Al Jazeera English. Oh. Hello, uh, this is Nizu from NHK, Japan. Uh, I'd like to say, I'd like to ask about the next your proposal in the nuclear negotiations will be held in the Geneva, and what kind of the uh, thinking about the, your positive proposal to the Western side? Thank you. Well, after all, the P5 plus 1 talks, as far as the, our new government is concerned, were initiated formally yesterday. That in and by itself was an important step that uh, as to the venue and timing of the next meeting and its approximate date which were discussed, uh, I think that was positive in and by itself as well. In the meeting yesterday, the general discussions that w the P5 plus 1 had, in total there were seven ministers included. Well, it was agreed that the environment, the setting was positive all in all, and that in the com talks and conversations, there were actually a lot of uh, common and mutual grounds. Another issue that, that was discussed in yesterday's meeting was that in the next uh, uh, meeting uh, in Geneva that Iran would propose its plan to the P5 plus 1, Iran will prepare that plan and will present it in Geneva. We hope that it will 
a m even a more effective step will be taken in Geneva in order to settle the nuclear issue. Mr. President, you've expressed a willingness to mediate between the Syrian government and the Syrian opposition to help end that conflict. Do you think there can be peace in Syria with President Assad still in power? And if so, how would you bring the opposition to the table when they've refused to participate in any peace talks with him present? On Syria, the the, in principle, we, it is essential that an agreement has to be arrived at between the government of Syria and the opposition. Now, you do know that when it comes to Syria, you have the government on one hand. On the other hand, you have the opposition. And the opposition, there is, you know, divisions of, of views among them as well. And they have splinters, etc. But added to that, you have terrorists who are active in Syria. We believe that any aid to the terrorists must halt, that terrorist groups must leave Syria as these terrorist groups come from main different countries from the region and have assembled in Syria and therefore must leave and the international community must show deep sensitivity to the presence of these Syri uh, uh, terrorist groups in Syria, and specifically al-Qaeda, because terrorism, as we know, is a very difficult issue for the region, a very uh, hazardous issue for our country and for the world. In my speech at the UN General Assembly, I proposed wave the war, a proposal for to build a world against violence and extremism. I believe that we must all walk hand in hand to fight extremism violence and terrorism, and no country will be able to win in this battle alone. Terrorists are like bacteria that travel constantly from one setting to another, from one point to another. So we must muster all our efforts so as to rid our community of it. And we must know that terrorism that can in principle be very dangerous for peace and world security. So on Syria, there's an issue of the terrorists on the one hand, and then another issue is the fact that there are Syrian opposition. That's a different issue, as we all know, that need to come to the table with the Syrian government. And what we must all come to accept in the end is that Syria needs a safe environment so that people can eventually go to the ballot boxes to cast their vote and make a decision together unanimously for their future and that everyone must support that. The future of Syria belongs to the people of Syria alone. Richard Ross, CNN. Thank you, Dr. Rouhani, uh, Richard Roth, CNN. I've sat at breakfast and had meetings with some of your predecessors here in New York. And shortly after somewhat similar remarks, uh, things tend to go off the rails. Something happens. You're in New York City. You're not on UN grounds. This is a city of straight, blunt talk. You want the media to be the messenger. You're being broadcast live. People probably around the world can't follow all of the negotiations, but they want to know more about you you the man why are you going to be different as the process goes forward than others who have appeared here leading Iran bearing the understanding that there are many issues between countries
Well, any difference that is seen is the difference in the choice the people made in the elections. They participated in an election, and there were, you know, different views, different debates from different candidates, and in some cases, there was a drastic difference between those debates that came out during the debates that the candidates held more specifically in on in the three uh, debates that were held on television. In the end, it was the people who chose the debate for moderation. They announced through the ballot box that they are opposed to extremism. They want to stop extremists from continuing the pa uh, on their way, continuing their way. Uh, their Mo the operandi, so to say. It, the people also voted in uh, our pro for our programs. Our programs are clear and were from the start, were clear from the start at that time. It's different parts and segments and uh, covered issues of foreign policy, internal domestic policy, uh, foreign relations, human rights, the status of women in our society. So the differences in the arguments was out there for everyone to see, and specifically through the clear plan that my platform presented, and my government will remain committed to its election pledges and will continue though. And in the very short period of time that my government has started its work, which is ra really a month and a few extra days, I would say, as you know, that we've really started our work. It's taken v important steps in ensuring the realization of those plans, and those steps will continue to c cover all the sectors that we wish to in the economic field. You know that our government had a very specific view. It emphasized a very specific view. The government emphasized the need to open up the private sector and also to assist to boost the private sector farther to create a positive business environment and to facilitate production and employment generation as part of key programs that we have. So in all these fields, and not just the economic field, but as well as also the social and cultural and in the foreign policy realm, we and domestic realm remains committed to its pledges. Thank you. Mr. Sadr, the President Press Advisor, has prolonged 10 minutes at uh, this press conference, and we have 20 minutes to raise more questions and answers. The next question, Mr. Afshar Dorabi, Irna. Thank you so much, Mr. President. I had a question vis-a-vis the, your foreign policy, which you reiterated and insisted upon during your electoral campaign as well, which was the relationship between Iran and the neighboring countries, particularly the Arab countries. During the visits that you had in New York City uh, with your with the Arab countries' representatives, did you hold any discussions specifically vis-a-vis -vis this topic? And if not, what do you foresee as future developments in your relations? از هاش رابطه مناسبتر و بهتر با همسایگان دولت اهمیت ویژه‌ای برای همسایگان قائل چه اونهایی که جزو کشورهای عربی هستند و چه اونهایی که جزو کشورهای عربی نیستند در کشورهای همسایه‌مون من دیدار داشتم as Russia gave to world leaders in whether from Russia, Turkey, Iraq, and Pakistan and Afghanistan. Russia, Turkey, Iraq, and Pakistan and Afghanistan. And countries in, in the region, including Lebanon, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, and some like Kazakhstan are, you know, are, are a neighbor. Lebanon is a distant neighbor, but yet a neighbor still. And uh, in these couple of days in New York, 
We also had the opportunity to meet with a group of leaders from a number of Arab countries as well as African states. In these meetings, on very, for various reasons, we did actually talk about Iran's relations with its neighboring Arab states. The premise of our pr plan is to build more confidence between Iran and its neighbors, to settle potential differences that could arise, to expand economic ties, to expand cultural interactions, and as well as tourism. We know that at a very grand scale, on a very grand scale, we have such things going for us with Saudi Arabia and Iraq on the question of tourism and with a number of other regional countries such as Bahrain and Oman. It's very good tourism that I'm speaking of that we have with these countries. Now, vis-a-vis -vis Saudi Arabia, I'd say this is the, the figure is very high. Iraq as well, millions annually travel. Uh, there and in Iraq also, but in other countries the figures are a little lower, but one of the key goals of my government is to build more sincere uh, and friendly relationship with our uh, uh, neighbors. And for that purpose, we have create, you know, built a series of meetings with our neighboring uh, neighbors, including our Arab neighbors. Let's continue with print media, Jay Solomon, Wall Street Journal. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, you campaigned uh, very much on improving the economy and rolling back the economic sanctions that have been put in place against Iran over the past five or six years. I'm interested in the six weeks that you've taken over, is the state of the Iranian economy better or worse than you, than you thought it was during the campaign? And what steps have specifically are you prepare, preparing to take to improve the uh, economic situation in Iran? Thank you. Iran. Uh the Iranian economy suffered from some shortcomings that we were more or less aware of all. You are aware that prior to my presidency, I headed a research center, and in principle, I was aware of many of the figures on it. Uh, I myself, as well as uh, the other candidates who ran during the elections, uh, covered the economic debate at length, in mindful of the shortcomings and the need to address them. Now, I have to admit that after I assumed the presidency, despite all, I became even more aware of the figures, and I'm still sort of educating myself on them because I've, my tenure has just started. But I promised my people that within 100 days uh, that I will present a report on the realities in the country. So I hope when that time frame comes to an end, I would have had the opportunity to clearly examine all the various dimensions of the economic program and issue, along with the, you know, social uh, 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 programs as well, and to offer better and clearer picture and figure to the people. My government believes that uh, while I am uh, as here as president in Iran, that all the figures should be provided to the people, all the information to the people fully transparently because I believe it is necessary to build more confidence between the people and the government and to enable the economists and other authorities in the different sectors 
to be able to better plan and better coordinate for the future. It's an absolute necessity in my view. And for that reason, I have entrusted the government spokesperson with the task of providing on a regular basis the necessary information that beset the conditions of the country as well as the government uh, with the people to share that information with the people. The president is also committed so that in every opportunity that arises, it provides information to the people and reports to the people on a regular basis. I hope that they won't be irregular and infrequent, but rather regular, and that I personally would have an opportunity to speak with my people on a regular basis. So if I were to give a single answer to your question, what I see today is a little worse than what I said or thought would exist in the before, but we are all hopeful about the future. Our social and economic problems can be resolved. My hope is that the people of Iran will support this government and that with the support of the people and the participation of the people as members of decision of our community will remove problems faster. Our hope outweighs our problems and the support of the people for the government is far more than could be expected. Therefore, our future is light, is hopeful, it is a future where our people will live with better welfare, with better comfort. This Margaret Warner, PBS News Hour. Oh, Mr. President, uh, when you headed the uh, Iranian negotiating team in, in nuclear negotiations back in 2003, afterwards you essentially ap appeared to boast that while you were talking with the Europeans in Tehran, you were continuing to build up the facility in Isfahan. And I think you said, in fact, by creating a calm environment, we were able to complete the work in Isfahan. So my question is, what steps are, is your government ready to take to assure the West, your negotiating partners here, that, that you aren't pursuing a similar kind of dual track approach uh, and that this isn't really also a way to buy time to achieve what they call breakout capability in your program? Whatever that was done in that period of negotiations was based on mutual agreement. We never told our European negotiators that we will not complete the Isfahan site. You are aware that from day one when the Isfahan site was being built, even before the actual bricks were laid, we had informed the IAEA months in advance and that it's the site buildup was also supervised by the agency. In none of my negotiations with the Europeans had I ever said that the Isfahan site will not be completed or not operationalized. In fact, the opposite. I had made it very clear that part Apart from the issue of infusing gas in the Natan site, we will continue all the rest of our activities. I said that in a press conference with three European ministers in an interview, a press conference in Tehran. So we have never chosen deceit as a path. We have never chosen secrecy. We have spoken transparently. We have talked transparently. We have acted transparently. And what we say today is what we will remain committed to. You will never see a case in my government where we would agree with the foreign governments or with its own people in which I would make a pledge to work against that pledge. We say explicitly and clearly that we want 
to have and retain nuclear technology. We say clearly that we also want our activities to be carried out under the supervision of the IAEA. We clearly say that we remain strongly committed to international law, including the NPT and the Safeguards Agreement. We say explicitly that we will be transparent. We say explicitly that we do not seek a bomb. We say explicitly that we believe that the building of a bomb is dangerous for us for our region. We say explicitly that in our defense doctrine, there is no room for weapons of mass destruction. We remain committed to all international role, law and regulations on the prevention of the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. We've acceded to them. We'll never deviate from our commitments. We shall not in the future. And through the P5 plus one, we want to even provide more assurances, if necessary, to the world that we want to tell them, assure them that our program will remain peaceful, and they too want to guarantee us that they will not take any action to undermine Iran's peaceful nuclear development and program. Therefore, the confidence will be mutual. We will reinforce that mutual confidence building in these talks, and I am hopeful that this confidence building phase will not take too long to create, and we will reach our goals very soon. Maeva Bambak, CCTV. Thank you very much. Uh, President, um, last month President Karzai visited Islamabad to negotiate the release of Taliban prisoners in order to bring the Taliban to the peace table. Uh, do you uh, think this is to be the consensus that the only way to stop the attacks in Afghanistan and Pakistan is to bring the Taliban to the peace table. Do you agree with that idea? And what new ways can um, Iran provi provide? Will Iran try to help in, in bringing them to the peace table? Which new solutions, since uh, the Doha conference seems to uh, not have brought any, any results, and that method of freeing Taliban prisons doesn't seem to be working either? What else can, can you offer? Next year, Afghanistan may face new problems and challenges. So from this very moment, those who can have an influence in the region should start thinking about how to cooperate further and help further the Afghan government. In the very few short weeks that I have assumed the, uh, my tenure, I have talked with Mr. Karzai twice, once in Tehran and once in Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan. Mr. Karzai has also expressed uh, deep concerns about Afghanistan's future. The debate here is that any group that comes to the negotiating table and remains committed to democratic frameworks and acceptable norms and rules emanating from that can be helpful on the issue of the Taliban. The key point is that groups that are carrying operations, some of which are terrorist by nature and design, um, to put those aside and uh, become active as ordinary citizens as a party in Afghanistan and to be a beneficial contributor to Afghan society. Of course, having said that, we're mindful that, that there are many differences between the Taliban and the Afghan government. They are still taking the early steps towards negotiations, uh, deeper negotiations. But should these negotiations lead to a political presence versus a military presence of Taliban in Afghan society, because 
you know, in the end, security has to be in the hands of official forces. So if the Taliban will ultimately announce its willingness to disarm, uh, disarm and to uh, operate as any other citizen in Afghanistan would, in my opinion, then such a peace will be beneficial for the future of Afghanistan and the stability of the region. Now, having said that, during the time that they led the government in Afghanistan, the Taliban brought about a lot of hardship for the Afghan people, especially in the sphere of social freedoms. They demonstrated extreme thoughts and ideas. I don't think that there's really any room for that in the world today. Uh, we cannot have such views about women, that women cannot participate in social life and activities. Women are like men and equal with men in, and must be equally active in the social sphere. We cannot bar a society's cultural path to growth and development. The plurality of culturalism, of thought, must be embraced and accepted, I hope that the Taliban will reemerge with a new thought, with a new way of belief to be present in the future framework for peace for Afghanistan. Peace on that premise, based on the will of the Afghan people, can therefore then be uh, effective and useful because war for Afghanistan is destructive. The people will suffer by conflicts and wars. They're tired of it. And terrorism has created a situation in Afghanistan where a very viable economy cannot yet take shape. Questions. Uh, Mrs. Somini Sengupta, New York Times. Thank you, Mr. President. What will you tell the people of Iran about the concrete results that have resulted, uh, that have been yielded by these meetings? Have they been what you expected or something less? In my presence here in New York, I have a have practically sought to have a uh, assess, to have a clear assessment of the world uh, setting, the world arena, uh, and how it may impact our programs. I think we've been quite successful with it. We sought to find the best path and method and explore the best methods to reconstruct Iran's regional and global status and standing in this regard when it has been at the level of talks and negotiations and in the expression of the various stances that all sides have expressed, I've seen in some cases a great deal of consensus and therefore results. Uh, you know, we sought to engage with anyone we w attempted, to, we wanted to speak to here. We met, as you know, with many leaders, and I believe that our success was greater than our expectation, especially with the European countries. We had meetings, talks, conversations which were very positive and I think that the path is ready, the has been paved to expand relations in various sectors with key ec world economies, at least those who I've been in touch on during this trip and that this can also pave the way for the development of ties in the not so distant future. Our effort was that on this trip we should 
really discuss the region, the security and stability of the region, Syria and the issue of weapons of mass destruction in our region, and terrorism and violence in our discussions with world leaders, with leaders and anyone we talk to. And I think in that regard, in specific, we were very successful, quite successful. Also, on the issue of Iran's nuclear program, in our discussions with the few countries that we had, we explained exactly what our plan is, what our plan for the future is, and how we can choose a path forward that will not only ensure the restoration of Iran's rights, but also build confidence for all those parties engaged in talks with us. It's quite hard to say you've reached all your expectations, but what I was able to achieve on this trip, I can say, given that it was four days, was acceptable to me um, and pleasing. And I want it to be the case that this trip will be a first step and a beginning for better and constructive relations with the countries of the world, as well as a first step for a better relationship between the two great nations of Iran and the United States of America, and that the views of our people, their understanding of each other will grow, and at the level of the two governments that at the very least we can, as a first step, stop further escalation of tensions and then reduce tensions as a next step and then pave the way for achieving of mutual interest on the third stage of the... Time's up, and we have only for one question. Uh, let's give the chance to Mrs. Ankuri. NBC News. Um, um, you just um, um, said uh, in this news conference that a proposal, um, a plan is going to be created and presented in Geneva by Iran. Our question to you is, um, can you say that um, Iran will present specific detailed proposals in Geneva or beforehand, and how soon... You mean Geneva too? The meeting in Geneva on October 15th. And then the second question, well, this is kind of related, is how soon do you expect, does Iran expect, specific detailed proposals on reducing sanctions? Well, our view is that, first and foremost, all countries must really agree, all of us, on a number of principles. If we can agree on, on a number of principles, then I believe that we can then develop a common plan and a common path or roadmap uh, in my discussions with the French President, Mr. Hollande, where we actually discuss a scope of regional issues, we actually discuss the framework of the principal views that Iran would like to base its discussions on. Uh, we like principles that are mutually acceptable to all of us and to move forward based on that premise to pave the to have a road map uh, for the future and begin moving on it for example we believe that syria must not be disintegrated the fragmentation of syria in our view is extremely dangerous for the region we believe that the terrorists must leave syria we believe that there should be no war that would be waged by or foreign powers in Syria and that 
we believe also that the solution to serious crisis is most definitively a political one and no other. We believe that the road should be paved to allow conditions which bring the opposition and the Syrian government at a table together. The principles that frame our outlook on these issues, should they be shared by the groups that we negotiate with, the countries we negotiate with, I believe will then definitely make it easier for us to have that roadmap in any meeting, any gathering. If we feel that these would be helpful, we will participate. Our participation will be without any preconditions. As Hamigi. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful. I hope that I was able to elaborate on s some of your questions and the views and comments that you made. I am aware that there was not sufficient time to receive all your questions. I look forward in, fu in the future, and thank you very deeply again.